All right, we're underway here. So we're uh, at session 19, lesson four of the life of Messiah. So let's do a little bit of review. Last week we finished up talking about leprosy, right? Yep. Not the most wonderful topic in the world. Now the term translated leprosy actually speaks of almost any kind of skin disease, some very curable, others not so curable. And leprosy would be the very worst version of that word. And a couple, couple of chapters in Leviticus, chapters 13 and 14, dealt, dealt with leprosy and the healing of a leper and what to do uh, if a leper, if a Jewish leper was healed. But we learned last week that uh, lepers had a heavy burden to bear. Leviticus 13, 45 and 46 said, As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn and the hair of his head shall be uncovered. And that's the uh, appearance of a mourner. Because you would be mourning, definitely, if you contracted uh, the worst kind of leprosy. He shall uncover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So the uh, crying unclean and covering your mouth and dwelling outside the camp was a form of um, quarantine. And of course if you had the most serious form of leprosy, uh, you were not cleansed from that infection. You had to remain outside the camp uh, for the rest of your life. And that was a heavy burden to bear. And the fact the rabbis in the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 47a, called this a living death. As Rav Yochanan said, he healed the leprosy of Naaman, which is the equivalent of death. It's a living death. And of course this, uh, this disease is still with us today. And Dr. Alfred Edersheim points out in the life and times of Jesus the Messiah these facts. Rabbinism confessed itself powerless in the presence of this living death. The possibility of a cure is in every instance traced back to the direct agency of God. Okay, don't forget that. The direct agency of God. In truth, the possibility of any cure through human agency was never contemplated by the Jews. Josephus speaks of it as a possibility granted to prayer. So this was a heavy, lifelong burden. Yes, question. On the last slide, who was the he that healed the uh, God did. Remember, he, he uh, came to the prophet and he was told to dip in the Jordan. Okay. So everything, uh, there, there's no instance of a Jewish leper being healed, okay? All righty, I believe that's where we pick it up now. On page uh, three, lesson four, page three. So where we finished was the, was the point that leprosy was so unique a disease, it was left out of rabbinical cures. It could not cure, they could not cure leprosy, only God could cure leprosy. That's where we ended up last week. All right, again, as background to the cleansing of the leper, we, we need to talk about the types of miracles in the middle of page three. Now, the following material was developed by uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, and uh, when he developed this material, he was a uh, young man teaching a Sunday school. He never dreamed that he'd be the head of a ministry that was uh, producing material that went worldwide. So he was, uh, the story I hear is he wasn't all that careful with his library resources and he misplaced um, where he got this material. So I cannot confirm this material uh, for you, but I have great confidence in Arnold's accuracy and uh, his understanding of the Jewish view of these miracles. And I'm expecting the documentation of, of what I'm going to share with you to be in his book on the life of the Messiah that's supposed to be out at the end of this year. It's supposed to be out at the end of this year. I worked for Ariel Ministries for 20 years, and I've been with Hadavar now for 11 years, and I've been hearing that the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so Arnold, I hope it comes out in 2012. I'm waiting for it, buddy. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Types of miracles. Now the rabbis divided miracles into two types. 
There are two types of miracles in rabbinic thinking. The first type was any man's miracles. These are miracles that were performed by anyone empowered by the Spirit of God. Anyone could do that. God chose to use you. You could be the agent of uh, this miracle. The second type of miracle we would call messianic miracles. These are miracles that only the Messiah could do. <coughs> only the messianic person can do, no one else. And there were three types of messianic miracles. Point A on your outline there. The healing of a Jewish leper. B, the casting out of demons of deafness and dumbness. And by dumbness we mean muteness there. Not that the fella doesn't have a good IQ. Okay? <laughs> muteness. A demon of deaf and dumb. He can't speak. And finally, C, the healing of a man born blind. Now, if you know your Gospels, those three miracles ought to be uh, ringing bells in your head. Ding, 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 ding. Ah, ho, ho. Well, maybe, maybe I see why these miracles were performed and why they're in the Gospels. <laughs> Whenever these miracles occur, you see that there's an unusual response in the context. And it's usually described. There's always an unusual response. And uh, what would be the reasoning behind that response? The re reasoning would be something like this. Number one, leprosy is incurable by man. The rabbis couldn't do that, right? Secondly, however, in the kingdom, all disorders and afflictions will be healed. This is the message we get about the kingdom. For example, just one verse dealing with the conditions in the kingdom, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. So those are, that's a, just a taste of the conditions in the kingdom. All right, step three in the reasoning. Therefore, the Messiah would have to heal all infirmities, including leprosy, when he arrives and institutes the kingdom. That's basically the thinking that's going on here. Okay? The Messiah is going to have to heal leprosy too. We can't have leprosy in the kingdom, can we? Of course not. All right. Okay, now going to the bottom of uh, page, going to the bottom of page three. We're looking at the heading, the Torah's instruction regarding a healed leper. So I want to give you a quick summary of the instructions contained in Leviticus ch chapters 13 and 14. This is just a quick overview. You can read those chapters yourself for the details. So the first step, a leper is healed. If a Jewish leper is healed, he was required to come to the priests and make an initial offering of two birds. Step two, this was to be followed by a seven-day full-scale investigation of the healing. The uh, priests were to ask questions, find out what was going on. How was he healed? What was the nature of the leprosy, of the skin disease? Was it the most severe type? Was he really a leper? Et cetera, et cetera. And there would be a written report of the leprosy on file. This priest declared this man a leper on this date. And that could be checked. Because this guy was supposed to stay outside the camp. All right, turn the page. I hear you turning your page. Very good. You're with me. All right, step three. Step three, if genuine leprosy and a genuine healing had occurred, on the eighth day, there are certain offerings would be made. There'd be a trespass offering, a sin offering, a burnt offering, and then a meal offering or a grain offering. Fourthly, the priests would then apply the blood of the trespass offering to the cleansed leper. The right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe. And most people go, huh? What's that all about? Well, this is a picture of total cleansing. Because going from the ear to the thumb to the big toe went from the top of the man to the bottom. Covered the man entirely. So a picture of a cleansing from head to toe. <clears throat> Fifthly, 
The priest would then apply the blood of the sin offering to the cleansed leper. Again, the right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe. And this would speak of return to service. The ear is, has blood applied to it so he could hear God. The thumb, blood applied to it so he could do the will of God. And the toe, the blood applied to it so he could walk with God. So we have the entire man cleansed and prepared for service from top to bottom through the application of blood from these two offerings. And if you took the tabernacle class, you see the priests were prepared in exactly the same manner. Sixthly, there would be an application of oil, which is, of course, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this would be a recognition of God's involvement in the healing. God has healed this man. The direct intervention of God has healed this man. But remember, in the history of Israel, these regulations had never been put into practice. They had never been implemented. Two chapters in scripture that seem to be a waste of parchment, a waste of time, okay? Well, Jesus heals the leper. Let's see what happens with this kind of background. So now let's turn to uh, the uh, middle of page four and the Messiah's instructions to the man. And we're going to pick up the account on Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. So we're on page 53 of your harmony. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all cover this event. So we're going to pick it up on the right-hand column. Uh, we're going to primarily be in the Luke account. Question? Yeah, on the, uh, on the instructions as to how to apply these things, is that something in the scriptures as far as the right ear? No, no, that's in Leviticus 13 and 14. Yeah, so that's specifically yeah and you see a very similar thing in the uh, in uh, Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus with the anointing of the priests for service. Yeah, very similar. All right, Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Everybody get there okay? And it came about while he was in one of the cities. Remember, he's on his Galilean preaching tour at this time, right? Okay, Jesus is wandering around Galilee and it, preaching in the synagogues. There was a man full of leprosy. And last week, uh, that told us that this man is near death. He has got the most severe form of this disease and he is in bad shape. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Pretty neat story. So this man recognizes the Messiah's authority as uh, his messianic authority, but he wonders about the willingness of the Messiah to heal him. And this touch of uh, this touch that Jesus uh, performed, reaching out and touching this man, was very very unusual because this was an act of love and of positive identification. You see, this man was untouchable. Okay, he had to stay, he had to walk around covering his mouth, screaming, unclean, unclean. You were supposed to stay away from a leper. Uh, it says he was full of leprosy. He may have not have felt human touch for years, decades, who knows, who knows. He's very sick. In fact, um, let's take a look at some rabbinic comments on, on touching. In the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, Dr. Edersheim summarizes it this way. Speaking of lepers, their burdens were needlessly increased. No one was even to salute him. You're not even to say hi, shalom, to a, to a leper. His bed was to be low, inclining towards the ground. If he even put his head into a place, it became unclean. Don't stick your head in here. Don't talk with me. Don't even get near me. No less a distance than four cubits, six feet, must be kept from a leper. And if the wind came from that direction, a hundred were scarcely sufficient. These were the rabbinic uh, traditions regarding a leper. Stay away from them. Rabbi Meir would not eat an egg purchased in a street where there was a leper. 
He didn't want to become unclean, you know. Another rabbi boasted that he always threw stones at them to keep them far off, while others hid themselves and or ran away. Rabbinism even forbade him to wash his face. So the, as he says, the burdens of the lepers were terribly increased. Yes? Um, didn't you say that the lepers were supposed to live outside the city? Correct. This sounds like they're right here in the city. Right, yes. Uh, they, uh, uh, of course, um, city limits probably were a little different than they are here. You'd have to take, probably take food out to the leper and drop it off and have them come out and get it, things like that. So there was a, some movement. Uh, interestingly enough, lepers were allowed in the synagogue. They had to enter last and leave first and had their own little spot. But so there was a certain amount of flexibility here. A certain amount of flexibility. And who fed them? Excuse me? Who fed them? Probably relatives. They, if they weren't too, too severely diseased, they might be able to do some uh, gardening or things like this. Who knows? But yeah, they survived, but they survived very poorly. Very poorly, yeah. I'd have to go to Edersheim on that and get that out of him. In the, in the synagogue, not in the temple. Okay. Uh, what's the symbolism of the, of the sacrifice of the two birds? Not the sacrifice, but one bird is killed, put in the water. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the other bird is immersed in the water and then released mm -hmm. by the priest. Well, it's always the, it's always the shedding of blood that takes right. care of the sin issue and uh, the, uh, the picture there of forgiveness and God's intervention and being freed from the disease, all that, okay? All righty. So anyway, the, uh, the burdens of the leper were uh, very, very uh, difficult and hard to bear. And, uh, but Jesus reached out and he touched this man. Very, very unusual. All right, let's go on to the 14th verse. Luke chapter five, verse 14. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, for a testimony to them. So here Yeshua uses this incident, this healing, and this man becomes a testimony to the priests. This will force the priests, led by the high priest, to begin this seven-day full-scale investigation regarding the nature of the miracle. In obedience to what? Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. So when they put those chapters into practice, what would they find? They would find out that Jesus had performed the miracle. And according to Jewish theology of the day, he was doing a miracle that only the Messiah could do. Okay? Remember the reasoning. Remember, leprosy is incurable by man. However, in the kingdom, all disorders and afflictions will be healed. Therefore, the Messiah is going to have to heal all infirmities, including leprosy, when he arrives and institutes the kingdom. That's the thinking there. Now, is this reasoning correct? Well, it is. And we'll see Jesus respond to this reasoning in uh, Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11... John the Baptist is imprisoned, and we'll, we'll read about this incident uh, when we get there. Now when John, John the Baptist, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, of the Messiah, he sent word to his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or should we look for someone else? How does Jesus respond to this reasoning? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So basically, Jesus responds very positively. He says to John's disciples, you're correct. This is what the Messiah will do. Now, what's your decision regarding who I am? Okay. So Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah by performing this miracle and he's forcing the Jewish leaders to come to a decision regarding his claims and regarding his person. Just like he forced John the Baptist and his disciples to make a responsible decision of faith. And guess what happens? He does that for me? 
And he does that for you, all of us. He always requires us to make a responsible decision of faith. Okay? And the, basically, the, the um, procedure is this. Messianic prophecy is the evidence. Look at the prophecies. Look at the life of Jesus. Make your decision. That's basically the pattern we're seeing here. Question. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, okay? We'll talk about being unclean and touching that leper in just a moment or two. So, I'm not trying to hold you off. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at, at Luke chapter 5, verse 15. Toward the bottom of page 53, again, the right-hand column. Verse 15. And the news about him was spreading even farther, and great multitudes were gathering to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. So note, news of this messianic miracle is going to spread like a California wildfire. Okay? <laughs> Believe me, it's going to go all over Galilee and further. All right? And that brings us to verse 16 and the Messiah's prayer. But he himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Why is he going to pray? He's going to prepare himself for what comes next. We'll get to that in just a moment. But before we go to the next event, I want to talk about this relationship between leprosy and the Messiah and uncleanness. Okay? Uh, you know, when you're in Jewish outreach, you're going to bump into anti-missionaries. And they're going to challenge your assertion that Jesus is the Messiah. And so that's happened to me on a number of occasions. And so... Uh, I've had to respond to that. And so here's an objection whoop, that uh, I got from an anti-missionary and it's on your, the top of page 5. This is what this fella uh, laid on me here. This is his charge. Jesus could not have been pure and thus sinless because he touched leprous and unclean dead bodies. In touching the leper he became impure under the Mosaic law Therefore, he did not perfectly keep the Mosaic Law, and he cannot be the Messiah. Okay? So, in other words, Yeshua's association with leprosy, the fact that he touched this leper, is a disqualification for the Messianic office. Okay? Sound intimidating, doesn't it? Well, here's a suggested response. And the response starts in the middle of page 9. My response was, the fact that Yeshua touched a leper... An unclean body does not disqualify him from messiahship. And this is especially true in light of the rabbinic doctrine concerning the leper messiah. Now this is rabbinic theology, you guys. Taken from Isaiah 53. In fact, contact with leprosy is a requirement for being the messiah. It's an authenticating qualification rather than a disqualification. Now here is Isaiah 53, 4. And here the rabbis will look at Isaiah 53, 4 and come up with a theology here. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now the key phrase there is, we ourselves esteemed him stricken. Now, the rabbis interpreted Isaiah 53 as associating the Messiah with leprosy. Here's what they said. This is in the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 98b, in reference to Isaiah 53.4. What is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said, his name is the leper scholar. As it is written, and here they quote it, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. Why? Because that phrase, we did esteem him stricken. The word stricken in the Hebrew means stricken by a loathsome disease. And what is the most loathsome disease they could think of? Leprosy. Leprosy. Yes, leprosy, especially when a man is full of leprosy. So, in their very own theology, the rabbis associated the Messiah with leprosy. 
Now, in addition, in the Bible, there is no record of a genuine leper being healed by man. Now, a number of lepers are healed. Moses in Exodus 4. Miriam, Numbers 12. These are both Jewish people. They're hired, they're healed outside the land. Naaman, 2 Kings, he was a Gentile. But all of these people were healed by the direct hand of God. Now when Yeshua touched a leper, it was an act of healing, not defilement. So the implication of this healing act, since there's no record of a leper being healed by man, and since there's no biblical record of a treatment or a remedy, the implication is that Yeshua is God in human form. God healed this man. Okay, the implication is that God himself reached out and healed this man. So this is no disqualification from the Messianic office here. And uh, in, uh, in his book, uh, The Rabbinic Messiah, Reverend Tom Huckle does bring out some other uh, Talmudic statements dealing with uh, leprosy and the Messiah. Here's the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 97a, a comment on Leviticus 13.13, 13, which associates leprosy with sin and states, the son of David, the Messiah. The son of David will not come until the whole world is converted to the belief of the heretics. Rabbah said, what verse proves this? And he quotes Leviticus 13.13. 13. It is all turned white. He is clean. Again, this is our chapter on leprosy. Now that seem, may seem a bit obscure uh, and obtuse to you, right? So there's a footnote in the, my English copy of the Talmud that explains the rabbinic idea. This refers to leprosy. A white swelling is a symptom of uncleanness. Nevertheless, if the whole skin is so affected, it is declared clean. And that's the point in Leviticus 13.13. 13. So here too, when all our heretics it is a sign that the world is about to be purified by the advent of the Messiah. So again, we have this association of the, of the Messiah, both spiritual and physical, with leprosy. All right, turn to page six in your outline. One more rabbinic quote. One more rabbinic quote from the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 98a. And this is a fascinating quote. I think this one is great. Rav Joseph ben Levi met Elijah. Remember, Elijah is the forerunner of the Messiah, right? He asked him, when will the Messiah come? Elijah's response, go and ask him. And uh, Rav, Rav Joshua says, and by what sign may I recognize him? And uh, Elijah responds, he is sitting among the poor lepers. So he's telling you, you're going to find the, the Messiah in the leper colony. Then he describes what the average leper is doing. All of them untie them all at once and rebandage them together. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the sores on a leper. A leper is covered with sores, so he says they unbandage all the sores, then they treat all the sores, and they rebandage them. That's what he's saying here. That's what the average leper is doing. Whereas, now speaking of the Messiah, he unties and rebandages each separately before treating the next. Okay, so the Messiah unbandages the sore, treats it, rebandages it up. Unbandages this one, treats it, bandages it up. Okay? Get the picture? He's acting differently than the average leper. Why? Thinking, this is what the Messiah is thinking according to the rabbis, should I be wanted it being time for my appearance as the Messiah. So the time comes for me to make my appearance to Israel and I'm called. I must not be delayed through having to bandage a number of sores. See, so I only have to bandage up one and I'm off. But if I have to bandage up 5, 10, 15, it's going to delay my coming as the Messiah. So again, not only is the Messianic person, huh? Doesn't make sense. Oh, <laughs> we, oh yeah, this is some rabbinic theology is way out there, you guys. But the point, the point I'm trying to make here is if you get challenged on this fact that Jesus touched a leper, 
there's plenty of ammunition to reply to it right out of rabbinic theology because here not only does the Messiah sit among the lepers but he is a leper himself okay and so the conclusion is that association with leprosy and the healing of leprosy is a qualification for the Messiah not a disqualification so what Jesus is doing in section 52 here is making a direct messianic claim not the reverse okay so uh, again if you're in Jewish outreach you're gonna run into this if you have Jewish friends you're gonna run into this if you want to be in Jewish ministries why do I bring this out you're gonna run into this because the anti missionaries are gonna challenge the messiahship of Jesus at every turn okay so I'm just getting you ready okay I hope you run into a man every one of you runs into an missionary and you bring them to the Lord <laughs> okay now page seven uh, Carol Andrews in the morning class put together this chart of these quotes and there's just one correction one typo on the chart on page seven uh, underneath the number two you see the the reference Exodus 5 6 and 7 make that Exodus 4 6 and 7 Exodus 5 6 and 7 should be corrected to Exodus 4 6 and 7 but that's a nice chart summarizing all of this in uh, one place okay everybody get that now on page 8 you have a uh, a article from um, the New Bible Dictionary on leprosy on page 9 you have an article from Easton's Bible Dictionary on leprosy just for your um, the, your own study and your own reading all right section 53 page 10 lesson 4 page 10 the forgiving and healing of a paralytic now section 53 is a direct result of the previous section a direct result let's start in Mark chapter 2 verse 1 section 53 is on page 54 of your harmony we're gonna basically be in the mark account the center column mark chapter 2 verse 1 and when he whoop and when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, so the preaching tour is ended, it was heard that he was at home. So we know exactly where this occurred. This occurred in Capernaum in, in Galilee. And notice it's called his home. He has now moved there permanently, and Peter is living there permanently as well. And if you visit Capernaum today, this is the uh, door, the gate into the archaeological area. You'll see this sign, and of course, notice the sign is called the Town of Jesus. And that sign is accurate because it became his headquarters. All righty. Verse 17. Let's go to the Luke account, just the right hand column, and pick up that verse. Luke 5:17. And it came about one day that he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing all right now Galilee is not a popular place for the rabbis yet what do we see here there's there's a Galilee in the north with Capernaum we see that rabbis come out of Galilee there were not a lot of them up there but there were some they come out of Galilee to Capernaum and the rabbis in Judea and Jerusalem make the trek up the Jordan River Valley to go to Capernaum why are they there well why because this is the direct result of section 52 this is their response to the healing of the leper this is their response and this also tells us that a very very important rabbi was there named Yochanan ben Zakkai and so you may be saying well who cares Bob who's this rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai guy well I'll tell you after the break <laughs> so take your break and you'll probably have a little shorter break at the moment because I took you a little over so take your break and listen for the shofar okay we're back 
We're back on it again, and um, I'm now obligated to explain to you all about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. All right, who was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? Well, we do Jewish studies here in our classes, so uh, we bring out information uh, like this. He was a very prominent rabbi, very, very important uh, to rabbinic Judaism of today, because he's the one who restructured rabbinic Judaism from a religion that required the temple and sacrifice into modern rabbinic Judaism that we have today. A religion that does not need temple or sacrifice. He's the one responsible for this. And we'll talk about him more as we go through. So let me just introduce you to him. Now, um, his story, his story is uh, found in Jacob Neusner's book, The First Century Judaism in Crisis. So if you're interested at all uh, about reading, of Rabbi, reading about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, this is a good book to get. It tells his uh, whole story. Now just some excerpts from the book to explain uh, the importance of Rabbi Yochanan to our section 53. Uh, Neusner, this is a uh, excerpt from pages 58 through 62 of First Century Judaism in Crisis. Uh, Neuser writes that sometime after the death of Hillel, now that would be Rabbi Hillel, a very prominent rabbi of the uh, pre-first century and the early first century, probably a contemporary of Jesus when Jesus was in the temple at 12 years old, a Rabbi Hillel was a very old man and he could very well have been one of the rabbis that Jesus discussed the Torah with and impressed. So sometime after the death of Hillel, Yochanan left Jerusalem for Galilee where he settled in a village called Arav near Sepphoris. Now Sepphoris is just a hop, skip and a jump from Nazareth just over the hill within walking distance. Arav, I don't know exactly where that's located but it's in the vicinity. So. Here, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Jesus are in close proximity. And as Jesus is doing his preaching tours, uh, you can bet Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai became aware of what was going on. Okay? We do not know why Yochanan went to Galilee. The region was not, as I said, a center of study of the Torah in the manner and traditions of the Pharisees. Well, as I understand it, he went to Galilee to be a Pharisaic missionary to uh, bring the uh, Galileans under the Torah, just like Chabad Lubavitch does today all over the world. So anyway, was he successful? No, he wasn't. In the third century, Ula and Amora and in Palestine stated, 18 years Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai spent in Arav, and only these two cases came before him. So here's this Pharisaic rabbi, he's in Galilee in order to bring people back to the Torah and to answer their questions. Rabbi, can we eat tomatoes? Rabbi, can we do this? Rabbi, can we do that? <laughs> and the Galileans aren't interested in this opinion. One question every nine years, all right? So he was not very successful in his ministry. So his uh, reaction at the end of, at the end he said, Oh Galilee, Galilee, you hate the Torah, your end will be to be besieged. So when he leaves Galilee, he curses the area. Curses the area because he feels that the Galileans are um, uh, ungodly. Now in um, Neusner's book and also in the in the Encyclopedia Judaica, and by the way, you can see an article there about Yochanan from Encyclopedia Judaica, uh, we get an account of his death. Now this guy looked Jesus in the eye face to face and rejected him, and this is the account of his death, you guys. A moving account is given of his death. When he fell ill, his disciples went to visit him. When Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai saw them, he began to weep. His disciples said to him, Light of Israel, pillar of the right hand, mighty hammer, why do you weep? Now that's exalting a sage, right? That's exalting a sage. We talked about that last week. However, I wouldn't mind if you guys got in that habit. <laughs> 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 all 
right. All right. Next time you raise your hand, you say, "Oh, pillar of, oh, light of Israel." <laughs> All right. All right, enough, enough. All right, his, uh, he's being exalted here by his disciples. He replied, If I were being taken today before a human king who is here today and tomorrow in the grave, whose anger, if he is angry with me, does not last forever, who, if he imprisons me, does not imprison me forever, and who, if he puts me to death, does not put me to everlasting death. And whom I can persuade with words and bribe with money, even so I would weep. So if I went before a human king, who, a high, who was only a human, he didn't have supernatural powers, and yet I could even reason with him, I'd still be very anxious, and I'd still be uh, weeping. Okay? He goes on. Now I am being taken before the supreme king of kings. I'm not going before a man, you guys. I am being taken before the supreme king of kings, who lives and endures forever and ever, and whose anger is an everlasting anger, who, if he imprisons me, imprisons me forever, who, if he puts me to death, puts me to death forever, and whom I cannot persuade with words or bribe with money. I'm not going before a human king, I'm going before the king of kings and I have absolutely no power and no say in what's going to happen. He continues, nay more, when there are two ways before me, one leading to paradise and the other to Gehinom, and I do not know by which I shall be taken, shall I not weep. This is the, the man who will become the most prominent rabbi of the time. He will survive the destruction of Jerusalem. He will restructure Judaism into what we know as modern Orthodox Rabbinic Judaism today. And this is the way he died. Very sad. No assurance of his salvation and a total rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus. Yeah, he chose his path. Yep. Question. Almighty Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you get an A. I don't, you don't have to show up for any more classes. You get an A. Can we have a copy of that slide? That should be in your article here in uh, about Yochanan ben Zakkai. Yes, it is on the starts on the bottom of page 14 and goes over to page 15. Okay, you've got that quote. The accelerated the accelerated students, yeah, the accelerated students sit in the back row, okay. All righty. This is Yochanan ben Zakkai. He will, I will talk about him again. He will come up again. But you need to know about this guy if you're interested in Jewish outreach. What is the name of the book? Question? Uh, first Century Judaism in Crisis. Jacob Neusner. First Century Judaism in Crisis. Jacob Neusner. That's his story in detail. Okay? All righty. Now, remember, the Sanhedrin was obligated, the Sanhedrin was obligated to investigate any messianic claim. And so what we see here in section 53 is the first stage of the Sanhedrin's investigation, the stage of observation. They will only observe. They will not ask questions. Remember, that's what they did with John the Baptist. Remember that, you know, 10 uh, sessions ago? The second stage of the investigation, the stage of interrogation, will come soon. We will see that as well. All right, so we're now on page 15, page 15 of your outline, in the middle of the page. Under the heading, The Healing, and we're going to pick it up on the Mark account. This is Mark chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, on page 54 of your harmony. Okay, middle column of the Mark account. Everybody get there okay? All right. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing him a paralytic, carried by four men. And being unable to get to him because of the crowd they removed the roof above him 
And when they had dug in the opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their face, said to the, said to the paralytic, Son, my son, your sins are forgiven. All right, they're in Peter's house, and this paralytic is brought to them. And again, remember this drawing of Peter's house, first century uh, Capernaum. Remember, it's an accurate drawing. Uh, if you'll remember, here's the doorway and the courtyard here, the main entrance to the main building of Peter's house, uh, the stairway here. And so everybody's crowded around in this area. They're filling up this area, they're shoulder to shoulder. They bring this guy in through the door and they can't get into, into the main door of the house here. So what do they do? They just go up the stairs here and onto the roof. Okay, just that simple. Just that simple and then this is not the greatest illustration but there's an idea of what they did. They dug through the roof and then somehow, in some way, uh, lowered him down into Jesus' presence. Okay? Uh, usually it was made up of uh, um, sticks cross-hatched and then mud and turf and things like that uh, put in it. Some people feel the very rich had tiles of some sort. So whatever it was, it was you could dig through it and open up the top of the roof. Okay? Question? Every time I, I read that story, I think, are those people down there in the basement or are they up in the room? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sure that what is going on up there, uh, it became quite apparent. Okay? All righty. Now, this palsied man is laid, brought down before Jesus, but Jesus does not directly heal him. Instead, he forgives his sin. Now, why in the world does he do that? Well, he did this because he knew it would raise the issue that it raises. The Mark account, verse 6. But there were some scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Okay, notice, this is going on between their ears. They are not saying anything. They're not vocal. Why? This is the stage of observation. They cannot ask questions at this point. So Jesus reads their minds. And again, this is a messianic claim based on Isaiah 11.3. Remember what Isaiah said? That the Messiah, the messianic person, will judge man, men by means other than seeing or hearing. And so when he does this, it's a direct claim to messiahship, a direct claim to deity. Why? Because only God can read men's minds. Remember we went over this earlier, 1 Samuel 16, 7. God sees not as a man sees, because the Lord looks on the heart. And Psalm 139, 1 through 4, David says, You understand my thought from afar. He goes on, Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Okay, only God can do this, and that's confirmed by 2 Chronicles 6.30. Solomon says, you alone know the hearts of the sons of men. So this is going to be an uh, incontrovertible claim to deity and to messiahship. All right, verse 7. Verse 7. Okay, the reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Guys, their theology is correct. Only God can forgive sins. And the rabbis taught that men only had a limited ability to forgive sin. For example, here's from the rabbinic commentary in the New Testament, Rabbi Locks. He says, in rabbinic Judaism, man could forgive a sin. And it was a moral imperative to do so when the sin committed was against himself. Okay? So, Roger insults me. Roger sins against me. I can forgive him. It's okay. I have that ability. You're forgiven over and over. <laughs> 70 times 7. Okay. <laughs> All right. Man has a limited ability to forgive sin if the sin is committed against him. But not for others. Not for others. You know, Roger insults G2 over there, and I can't 
forgive him. Okay, I can't do that. Okay. For forgiveness is from God through direct access and not through an intermediary. All right, that's rabbinic theology. You have to directly experience the sin before you can forgive it. But what does Yeshua do? Jesus forgives all of this man's sins wherever and whenever they occurred. You see, he forgives all the paralytic sins directly. The paralytic had not sinned against Jesus. Okay? In other words, his statement is a plain spoken and unmistakable claim to deity. Only God can do this. They are right. And Jesus is doing it. Verses 8 and 9. And immediately Yeshua, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Arise and take up your pallet and walk? Of course, in verse 8 you see him read their minds, and he lets them know that he's doing that. Now, he, he raises an issue here. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to heal? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because no outward proof is required. I can say to all you guys, your sins are forgiven. Can any of you prove me wrong? No, of course not. It's very easy for me to say it. I just did. I just did. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> no, you have the authority to do that in the confession in the, in the confession church. Okay. All righty. Now Yeshua is arguing from the lesser to the greater, the from the minor premise to the major premise. This is called Kalva Omer arguing or reasoning in rabbinic thinking. We'll run across this again. Kalva Homer, from the lesser to the greater. So it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. That's the minor premise. There's no outward proof needed. It's harder to heal because that requires visible evidence. That's the major premise. Outward proof is essential. All right, verses 10 and 11. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. So basically, in order to prove to you that I have authority to, for, to forgive sins, I'm going to provide you with visible evidence. Verse 12, and he arose and immediately took up the pallet and went out in the sight of all, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So immediate evidence is provided of the Messiah's authority, not only to heal, but by implication to forgive sin as well. So this shows that he is God, <coughs> and he can forgive sin. This is a claim to deity. He's doing only what God can do, and he's proving it. So they have no basis for rejecting him. And yet it will happen. All right, page 15, lesson four at the bottom. This is the turning point. This is the turning point. They will now begin to look for reasons to reject him. So section 53, the first stage of the Sanhedrin's investigation, the stage of observation is complete. These men will go back to the Sanhedrin with their report. Their, rep their report will be, this is a significant messianic movement. You better bet your sandals on it. This is a significant messianic movement. And so, the second stage will begin. The stage of interrogation will begin, and we'll see the Pharisees asking questions and demanding answers. So look for that as we move along. All right, page 16. Turn your outline to Lesson 4, page 16, and we're at section 54. And we'll be able to get through this, I think, before we call it quits for tonight. All right, section 54 is the call of Matthew. So this is the call of the next disciple. This will be disciple number 7. Now, Matthew was a publican. 
Now, what were the publicans? Well, the publicans were the local tax gatherers for Rome. And the publicans were allowed to do something that infuriated the Jewish population. The publicans were allowed by Rome to extort additional amounts in excess of the required tax from their fellow Jews. So if Caesar said to Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen, you owe me five shekels, uh, Matthew could come along and say, Mr. Cohen, you owe ten shekels. Five to Rome, Rome is happy. Five to Matthew, Matthew's happy. And Mr. Cohen is steamed. Okay? All right? So they were Romanizers, and they were very wealthy. The rabbis were so upset with them that they were not eligible to be either judges or witnesses at a trial because they were considered unreliable. Sanhedrin 25b. As to tax collectors and tax farmers, at first it was thought that they take only what is specified as the tax. But once they saw that they took more than the defined tax, they declared them invalid as a witness or as a judge. And if one family member was a publican, all the other members of the family were considered likewise. Shavuot 39a said Rabbi Simeon, if he <laughs> sinned, what sin did his family do? Why should we uh, consider the family in the same boat? But this verse, but the verse intends to tell you, you have no family in which is found one tax collector that really is not entirely made up of tax collectors, or in which is found one robber that really is not entirely made up of robbers, because they afford protection to the one who is a tax collector or a robber. Okay, this is the concept we have in our modern legal system of the accessory to the crime. Aiding and abetting. Aiding and abetting, right, ex exactly. There's the accessory before the fact. This is in our modern legal parlance. A person who, though not present, during the commission of a felony is guilty of having aided and abetted another who committed a felony. So we have an accessory before the fact and there's also the accessory after the fact. A person who knowingly conceals or assists another who has committed a felony. So the family were, were considered accessories to the crime. And so they, along with the publican, were regarded as traitors and apostates they were considered defiled by their frequent association with the heathen and as willing tools of the Roman oppressors. And so that for all practical purposes they were excommunicated from Israel. Now lesson 4 page 16. There were two classes of publicans, the tax gatherers and the customs house official. The customs house official was the worst kind of publican because they had more freedom to extort than the tax gatherers had. And Matthew, as we will see, is a customs house official. He is the worst kind of publican. Now, going on in your notes there. The objects of taxation were so numerous that modern scholars have not been able to identify them all. They taxed axles, wheels, pack animals, pedestrians, roads, highways, admission to markets, bridges, ships, river crossings, dams, licenses, and on, and on, and on, and on, and on. Sounds like California, doesn't it? <laughs> Nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> All right, the rabbi said that that it was almost impossible for tax gatherers and custom house officials to repent. And Dr. Edersheim sums it up there. The customs house official ruled supreme in his insolence and rapacity. Rapacity. He raped, he raped the, the people. They had an insatiable appetite for money. Okay. Excuse me? In the sense of stealing money from them, okay? Patience. Yes. Uh, verse 9, verse 9. Uh, we're on section 54, the call of Matthew. This is page 55. 
And we're in the left-hand column, Matthew 9, verse 9. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said, he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So we learn that Matthew is in the tax office. That tells us that Matthew is a customs official. He is the worst kind of publican. It is a job, top of page 17, that is forbidden to Jews by the Pharisees. And yet Matthew has taken that job. And so he and other publicans were classed with prostitutes. And so repentance for publicans and prostitutes was virtually impossible, said the Pharisees. Now God didn't say that, but the Pharisees did. So this man that we're being introduced to here is the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> this is the guy who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. This is an example of the transforming power of God. The transforming power of God. This guy loved money and hated people. And when it was through, he was a totally different man. So, that's the transforming power of God in my life, in your life, in that family member's life, okay, in that person you think could never come to the Lord, you think that person is hopeless, never give up on the transforming power of God. Okay, I saw a question. In the Mark and Luke count, he's referred to as Levi, are these parallel accounts? That's, that's my next comment here. Take a look at the Luke account, verse 27. That's the right-hand column. We see his alternate name. We see his alternate name. And after that, he went out and noticed a tax gatherer named Levi. So that's not unusual in the Jewish community to have alternate names. So let's finish up the Luke column there. Sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and rose and began to follow him. Now Matthew has been aware of Jesus because Jesus has been going around Galilee on two preaching tours. So Matthew has heard about him. Matthew perhaps has observed him. This is not something that comes out of the blue for Matthew. And Matthew has gotten to the place where he's willing to take his chances with Rome. He's willing to quit his job and leave and follow the Messiah because he sees that the Messiah's authority supersedes Rome's authority. So he's been watching Jesus closely He's been prepared by Jesus indirectly. He is now ready to move out into ministry. It didn't happen overnight. All right, that brings us to section 55, uh, which we will, let's see. No, we'll try to get, ooh, boy, we're getting close here. Uh, let's get through this paragraph, and then we'll call it quits, because the morning class got through this paragraph. All right, section 55, the banquet at Matthew's house. So Matthew, in response to all this, throws a party. And we pick this up in the, Matthew, in the Luke account, uh, chapter 5, verse 29. That's the right-hand column on page 56. Everybody there? And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax gatherers and other people who were reclining at the table with them. So Matthew throws this party for his friends. But Matthew is basically excommunicated from the society. So what kind of friends does Matthew have? Ex tax collectors and prostitutes. That's his friends. With the exception of Jesus and his disciples. That word sinner there is a euphemism for prostitute. So Jesus and his disciples are sitting in the midst of all these people eating with them. But now we see that the investigation by the Sanhedrin has begun. They are there, they are observing, they are asking questions. This is the stage of interrogation. So they issue a protest. Page 18, we're on page 18, in the middle of the page. Luke chapter 5 verse 30. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax gatherers and sinners? Their point, if this guy was the Messiah, he would never associate with this class of people. 
Never. We don't. He wouldn't. You know? Yeshua issues a response. And for that, we will go to the Matthew account. Go over to the left-hand column, verses 12 and 13. But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So the Messiah makes three points. And I can't help but feel there's a note of sarcasm in his voice. Because the, the Pharisees considered themselves quite healthy. Okay? So he says the sick need healing. And the publicans and the prostitutes are sick. They are sin sick. And the Pharisee, Pharisees would say, Amen, preach it, brother. They would agree 100% with that. But he also notes that the Pharisees are char characterized by much sacrifice and very little mercy, very little compassion. And notice the emphasis on compassion there, you guys. Unfortunately, the Christian church can be just this way. We are famous for shooting our wounded. We are famous for shooting our wounded. So let's keep this characteristic of God high in our radar. Compassion and mercy. Okay? Thirdly, he goes on to say, it's not the righteous but the sinners who need to be called. Okay? So this is his initial conflict with the religious leaders. It will pick up steam from this point on. Okay? The investigation is well underway. All right, I've only kept you guys two minutes over, so let's go ahead and call it quits for tonight, and let me pray, and I'll turn you loose, and we'll come back next week at section 56, a very, very important section. All right, let me pray. Father, again, I want to thank you for your word, and I do want to thank you for the very strong application we've ended with here this application to be compassionate people. Not to, um, not to enable sin, not to approve of sin, but to be compassionate toward the sinner because of our understanding that they are the sick that need to be called. Why? Because we were once the sick that need to be called. We were the ones that needed compassion and you extended compassion to us and we receive the gift of eternal life because of your work in our life. So Lord, always help us to remember from where we came and to be the type of people that can reach out to those around us with the good news, uh, with the bad news that um, you will bring judgment against sin, but with the good news that the sick can be reached and healed of their sin sickness through your grace and your compassion by trusting Yeshua. Help us do that to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys next week.